Welcome back to What Killed the Dinosaurs, Part 3. I'm sorry for the delay and for the poor quality of my production, and as promised, I will explain that and my motivations at the end of the series. At the end of the last episode, I left you to research the debate between the meteor theory and the volcanic theory, and I introduced my ingredient to the debate, water. In part two, I explain in brief volcanic hotspot chambers. And what causes super eruptions. My research into super eruptions started when I was writing a novel set in the time of the Tomba super eruption in Indonesia 75,000 years ago. I became fascinated with volcanoes and read everything I could find. As I tried to illustrate the extreme effects of the eruption in my novel, I was having problems grasping the full scope of the eruption. And at one time, it wasn't even big enough for my overactive imagination, and I wanted it even bigger for dramatic purposes. But as it stood, the event I was trying to depict on the page was big enough and catastrophic enough. <coughs> Excuse me. That was until I realized that most old volcanoes, when they collapse after erupting, leave large craters which fill with water and become lakes. I drew a crude diagram and when I saw the cross section, it immediately frightened me for some reason. And as I stared at my crude drawing, I wondered, what if the lake flooded into the magma chamber? I suddenly understood why I'd been frightened at what I was looking at, by what I was looking at. I, like millions and millions of others, worked during my teenage years in a restaurant and worked with a deep fryer. During my training, I was taught never throw water onto a grease fire. If you've ever deep fried something frozen with a lot of ice on it, or had water from your hands drip into the oil. You've noticed the violent reaction which follows as the fire pops and snaps as it overflows. I realized that a super eruption could even be bigger with the introduction of water. If a magma chamber was inundated with cold water, it would cause an explosion of staggering proportions. At first, I wasn't sure my idea was anything new, or if it was even possible for a lake to empty into a volcanic chamber. I explored the idea further and wondered how this phenomenon might work, and after a short while, it started to make sense. I know my graphics aren't high-tech, <laughs> and as I said, I will explain everything later. But for now, here's how a mega hydrothermal nuclear mass eruption works. First, you have, as I've described, a lake which sits peacefully above a dormant hotspot. Over time, the pressure slowly builds and the ground above the chamber begins to dome. This uplift has happened at Yellowstone National Park. The event lifted one end of the lake so high that water spilled from the other end. Uplift of the magma chamber causes the crust to experience numerous earthquakes. These numerous earthquakes cause fissures, and these fissures can open at the top of the chamber until under the enormous pressure and stress. This is the critical moment, because the water from the lake and or groundwater, by the simple force of gravity, pours down into the magma chamber and is instantly transformed into steam, 
which is in turn which in turn increases the total pressure. As the steam increases the pressure, it opens more and more fissures and widens those already open. The whole system accelerates quickly at an exponential pace. The water turns to steam consisting of a superheated oxygen and hydrogen mix, not to mention the multitude of other volatile gases already present in the magma chamber. The gases pressurize the chamber until there is an overload. The steam reaches a critical mass. The temperature and pressure ignite the oxygen and hydrogen at a molecular level and the event becomes nuclear fission in a fraction of a second. The entire chamber explodes through the crust and the magma blasts through the atmosphere. The eruption and the effects that would follow are almost unimaginable. I have several theories about the aftermath and the effects of a mega eruption that it would have on the planet. And I realize that if this event had happened, there should be evidence left behind. The calderas of most volcanoes are too small to qualify, it, but something as big as I've described should have left behind a giant caldera. And guess what? I found a giant caldera. In fact, I found many giant calderas. But the largest and the most obvious caldera is in Hudson's Bay. In fact, it is a series of three eruptions, which in Hudson's Bay align perfectly with the direction of continental drift. And guess what? In continental drift. In part four, I will show you the mathematical proof. I will show you how you can do the geometry yourself at home on any map of Canada. All you need is a compass, a pencil, and a ruler. So I hope you keep watching for part five of what killed the dinosaurs. Mystery solved. Catch the math which unraveled the biggest mystery on the planet. Thank you.